Welcome to St. John's on this first Sunday of Advent. And we're happy to welcome Pastor George Zicarda back to lead our service this morning. Always a pleasure having you with us. So thank you. Um, there will be a worship service this coming Saturday night at 5 p.m. in Fritz Hall. So everyone is welcome to come to that service also. Also next Sunday, we will have our annual congregational meeting. It will be at noon on Zoom. And you should have gotten an email as to the link and how to join by phone if you don't have a computer. And if not, contact April in the office and she'll be happy to email it to you. The annual reports, you should have gotten an email with that also. If you would like a hard copy and are here present today in person, there are hard copies in Fritz Hall you can pick up on your way out. Or you can call April in the church office if you're tuning in via live, live stream. Giving tree gifts are due next Sunday, so please make sure that if you took a tag, you make sure your gift is here by next Sunday. And you still have a few more days to order poinsettia plants. So if you're interested in that, please email April. Okay, so we'll, if you want to rise, we'll start our service with the greeting. The greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We start with a prayer for the first Sunday in Advent. We praise you, O God, for this evergreen crown that marks our days of preparation for Christ's Advent. As we light the first candle on this wreath, rouse us from sleep that we may be ready to greet our Lord when he comes with all the saints and angels. Enlighten us with your grace and prepare our hearts to welcome him with joy. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain and whose day draws near. Amen. Okay. You may be seated. A reading from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord.
A reading from 1 Thessalonians. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to St. Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, distress among nations. Confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves, people will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly, like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Good to be back with you again and sharing worship this morning. And it's nice also to only have to travel very few miles to get here. Usually I'm up in the coal region somewhere, so nice to come back to St. John's again. Today, of course, we are beginning a new church year with this first Sunday in Advent. And also beginning a time when we begin our season of preparation, preparing for the coming of Christ into the world and more importantly, into our lives. Today I'd like to, if I can find it, here we go, use a sentence from Paul's letter to his church at Thessalonica and part of the gospel this morning. Paul challenges his congregation at Thessalonica and says, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. And may he also strengthen your hearts in holiness, that you may be blameless before God and the Father at the coming of Jesus Christ. And in our gospel this morning, so be on guard that your hearts may not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and worries of this life. This morning I'd like to begin with a short story.
After the dishes are washed and the sink rinsed out, there remains in the strainer at the bottom of the sink what I will call momentarily some stuff. A rational, intelligent, objective person would say that this is simply a mixture of food particles too big to go down the drain, composed of bits of protein, carbohydrates, fat, and fiber, kind of a dinner dandruff. Furthermore, the person might add that not only was the material first sterilized by high heat of the cooking, but further sanitized by going through the detergent and hot water of the dishpan and rinsed. No problem. But any teenager who has been dragged into washing dishes know that this explanation is a lie. That stuff in the bottom of the strainer is toxic waste, deadly poison, a danger to health. In other words, about as icky as icky gets. One of the reasons I always had respect for my mother when I was 13 was because she would reach into the sink with her bare hands, bare hands, mind you, and pick up that lethal gunk and drop it into the garbage. To top that, I saw her reach into the wet garbage bag and fish around in there looking for a lost teaspoon, barehanded, a kind of mad courage. She found the spoon in a clump of coffee grounds mixed with scrambled egg remains and the end of the vegetable soup. I almost passed out when she handed it to me to rinse off. No teenager who wanted to live would have touched that without being armed with gloves, a face mask, and stainless steel tongs. I lobbied long and hard for a disposal and an automatic dishwasher, knowing full well that that's why they had invented, so that nobody would ever have to touch that gunk again, but to no avail. My father never came closer than three feet to the sink in his life. My mother said he was lazy, but I knew that he knew what I knew about that gunk. Once after dinner, I said to him, I'll bet Jesus never had to wash dishes and clean the gunk out of the sink. He agreed. It was the only theological discussion we ever had. My father, however, would take the plunger to the toilet whenever it was stopped up with even worse stuff. I wouldn't even go into the room when he did it. I didn't want to know. But now, I'm a grown-up and have been for some time. And I imagine making a speech to the high school graduating class. First, I would ask them, how many of you would like to be an adult, an independent, on-your-own citizen? All would raise their hands with some enthusiasm. And then I would give them the list of things that grown-ups do. Clean out the sink strainer, plunge out toilets, clean up babies' diapers, wipe runny noses, clean ovens and grease traps and roasting pans, and carry out the garbage. I tell the graduates when they can do these things, then they will be adults. Some of the students might not want to go on at this point, but they may as well face the truth. A willingness to do your share in cleaning up the mess, taking out the garbage of this life, is a condition of membership in community. When you were a kid, you feel that if they really loved you, they would never ask you to take out the garbage. When you join the ranks of the grown-ups, you take out the garbage because you love them. And by them, I mean not only your own family, but the family of humankind. A willingness to do your share in cleaning up the mess, taking out the garbage of this life, is a condition of membership in community. I think when I read that, it came to me that there was really probably a very fine line between being a child and childish and being a responsible adult. And a lot of times it has nothing to do with age. If you truly love me, you would never ask me to take out the garbage. But because I love you, I will take out the garbage. In our reading this morning, Jesus again challenges us to love one another. Because he has loved us, therefore we need to love one another. And by this, the world will know that you are my disciples. <clears throat> the challenge comes to each of us today, that because we have been loved, so we must love one another. And even the, in the form of cleaning out the gunk and taking out the garbage. 
I think love takes on a very specific activity. You can, you can love, I guess, in thought and in something that's around us. But really, love takes on the form of very specific acts as we treat one another and live with one another in this world. <clears throat> this morning, as we begin the season of Advent, the challenge comes to us again that we need to be ready. We need to prepare for the coming of God into our life. That's what Advent is all about, preparing for the birth of Jesus into our world, eternity entering our time and space and claiming us as his children. And it's not that easy to prepare for the coming of God into our life, into each of our lives, because for each of us, it's going to demand that we change. Paul, in his lesson, in his writing to the Thessalonians, uh, challenged them in their daily life for the presence of Christ in their life. Not just the coming of Jesus as a child, but rather the coming of Jesus as the Son of God into our lives each day. As we prepare for that each morning, that takes some preparation on our part. If you remember, the message of Advent is really one of repentance. There's a little filler I read in the paper not too long ago. Right after Hurricane Isabel hit, a priest and a pastor from the local churches were standing by the side of the road, pounding a sign into the ground which read, The end is near. Turn yourselves around now before it's too late. Leave us alone, you religious nuts, yelled the driver as he sped past. From the curve ahead, they heard the screeching of tires and a big splash. The pastor turned to the priest and asked, do you think the sign should just have said, bridge out? <laughs> That's what repentance means, not bridge out. But the, print, the word repentance means to turn around, turn yourself around 180 degrees and go in an opposite direction to begin to reform yourselves, to take on a new character, a good character within life. And so that's the challenge of each of us as we prepare for the coming of Christ at this Christmas time. We prepare in different ways. It's very easy to prepare for the coming of Jesus as a child. And we all do it in our homes with our decorations, put up our crushes, and buy all those wonderful presents and things. But the coming of Christ as an adult, as the Son of God, into our life each day takes a bit more preparation and becomes a real challenge to each of us. <clears throat> the challenge for us, of course, is to turn ourselves around, to work on our character defects and, a good <clears throat> and become a better person, to accept the fact that we are imperfect individuals, and that we can change to improve our character, and that we want to become better as human beings. For me, a good way that I need to work on my character is that each night, I kind of take a, a daily inventory. Well, how did I do today? Uh, what good things did I do that I was, felt pretty good about? And what things did I fail at? Who did I hurt today? Uh, how did I act in ways which was harmful to others? And after that, we kind of take a look at the defects within each of us. What are your defects today? <clears throat> are they jealousy or self-centeredness or anger? It's not easy sometimes to take our own inventory. We're much better at taking other people's inventories, right? Especially your spouse. We know all their character defects, at least I do, <laughs> uh, even though she doesn't believe them. But for each of us, the real trick is to take our own inventory. Who are we as individuals? What things do we need to work on to become a better person? What things do we need to work on to become really God's children here and now? <clears throat> Excuse me. I seem to have allergies all year long, and so every time so well, it's kind of hurts. John challenges us today, and Paul, as to, in our preparation for 
the coming of Christ, that we take a look at ourselves and we try to improve who we are as God's children. When God comes into our life, he demands change. He demands that we become the person that he created us to be. When I was in seminary in Philly, uh, I got married my last year in seminary and moved into an apartment uh, down on Mount Pleasant Avenue. And uh, I remember meeting with the landlord that day to uh, sign <coughs> the little paper. And he said, you can move into the apartment, but there are certain things that you need to do. First, you need to be sure that you take out the garbage every day. And before you go out each morning, you need to make sure that the windows are closed. And finally, you need to get to bed early because your kitchen is right above our bedroom and I need to get up early. Uh, you're like me, we enjoy doing, entertaining in the kitchen, especially playing cards. So you can move into the apartment, but here are the things that you need to agree to. Well, it's interesting that God has never moved into our life with those types of <clears throat> those types, excuse me, of demands. He asks that we be open and willing to be his people. Sometimes when God moves into our life and demands change, we want to hold on to some of those old things, those old character defects that we become so good about. We like to hold on to some of our resentments. We don't want to let them go. We'd like to sleep in some Sunday mornings and not have to get up and come to church, especially on a morning like this where we're cold and damp and a little bit of snow on the ground. He's saying that we must now let them go. When he moves into our life, it's all or nothing. And he demands that we begin to the difficult job of changing, of becoming his people in this time and age. God only asks that we do his will as his people. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works glorify your Father in heaven. A line from our baptismal service, a line which we are asked to live up to each day, letting the light of Christ shine through us to others, becoming the presence of God to those around us, so that it may see us and that they may know us. I don't know if I shared this story with you or not before, but <clears throat> after church there was a, a young girl downstairs in the nursery. Grandfather went down to pick her up. And what was she doing? She was drawing a picture. And he goes over and says, what are you drawing? She says, well, she said, I'm drawing a picture of God. Well, the grandfather says, nobody knows what God looks like. Well, she said enthusiastically, they will when I'm finished. <laughs> My hope is that when our lives are finished, those around us may have a better idea of what God looks like. Because somehow, our life and our destiny is part of God's plan for this world that we become his presence to those around us, that we let our light shine before others, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Today, as we prepare now for the coming of Christ on Christmas Eve, he simply asks that we begin the process of changing, of becoming better people, and we take a look at our character defects and try to change them and can become his presence to those around us. This morning as we eat the bread and as we drink the wine, Christ again comes into our life and sees us as his children. He loves us and accepts us and now sends us out to love one another. The challenge of Paul in the first letter of Thessalonica says, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the book of Luke, be on guard that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. Amen.
Let us stand this morning and proclaim our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended. On the Lord day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please keep these people in your prayers this week. Robert G., who had been a patient during the week at Lehigh Valley Cedar Crest and now is home. Mike, son-in-law of Nancy C., Mike's mother, and his son Tyler, who have all tested positive for COVID-19. Steve C., who finishes his chemo for multiple myeloma, but will be starting transplant, transplant prep for the bone marrow transplant. Matt W., Mary H., Archie S., Marcy W., Janet P., Bruce M. Is there anyone else for whom we should be praying today? Yes, Mary? Pat and Bonnie. Pat and Bonnie? Connie. Connie. Pat and Connie. Anybody else? Mike's brother, David. Leona? Diane. Okay, anybody else? Okay, please rise as you're able for the prayers. In this season of watching and waiting, let us pray for all people and places that yearn for God's presence. God of presence and peace, Strengthen your church around the globe to proclaim the message of your love coming to the world. Open your hearts to recognize your face in all people and in all creation. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of mighty redwoods and microscopic plants, fields and city parks, the wind and the waves, be a healing balm to our wounded planet. May we nurture what you have lovingly created. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of equity and compassion, bring righteousness and goodness to all peoples of the earth. Give a heart of discernment and integrity to leaders in our communities. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of comfort and care, be present with those who watch and wait. Come to all who await births, death, divorces, new unions, new jobs, retirements, healing, and life transitions of every kind. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of promises kept and new dreams awakened, shelter your people from destructive storms. We pray for those whose lives have been upended by natural disasters. For the work of Lutheran Disaster Response, Lutheran World Relief, and other relief organizations. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, Your mercy is great. God of companionship and community, we give you thanks for the saints who journeyed with us and now abide in you. Even in distress and uncertainty, make us confident that your promises endure forever. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers that were lifted up today and those in our hearts for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
The congregation will stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy One, the beginning and the end, the giver of life, blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you for the darkness and in the light. Blessed are you for your promise of your people. Blessed are you in the prophet's hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. Blessed are you for your son Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, the word made flesh. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ, Christ will come again. With this bread and cup we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. Remember our new birth in his death and resurrection. We look, for, we look with hope for his coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Holy God, we long for your spirit <clears throat> Come among us, bless this meal, and your word take flesh in us. Awaken your people, fill us with your light, bring them the gift of peace on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel. Word of God incarnate, power of the Most High, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, our Lord, 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 our Now may the blessings of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with us now and evermore. Amen. Christ, give it. 